Hey, what up? Good to be talk here. Why do a lot of paranormal encounters have an electrical charge in the air? A humming or a buzzing or an electric feel? I keep hearing a recurring theme in a lot of paranormal videos, and that is the electrical charge feeling in the air, humming, buzzing, or crackling. Now, in my last video, that night, monsters under the bed, I had an interesting comment by somebody named Milo Aaron 8338 so I don't know who this guy is. I'm guessing, actually I don't even know if it's a guy, so forgive me if I got you wrong. But anyway, Milo Aaron said, people hearing crackling plastic like a candy wrapper sound is reported a lot before encountering these entities. Which made me think of astral projection, sleep paralysis, and shamanism. A lot of the times when people astral project, they hit something called the vibrational state. So for those of you who have had an out of body experience and you feel that electrical uh, humming or buzzing in your body, like electricity crackling or kind of like a wind or it's hard to describe exactly what it feels like for it's, it's subjective. So not everyone feels it the same, but it's something along those lines. For example, I guess when you're more scared and you're about to have an out of body experience, you hear a, a more electrical feeling and it feels like like bolts of electricity snapping and crackling around you but when you get more used to it it could sound like a wind like whoosh. i remember one time i thought i was gonna die because i felt like my heart was pounding so hard that uh it was gonna explode but then i realized that my hand was sitting like uh, sleeping funny and i realized my hand was right here and i was like wait a minute my hand could feel my pulse let me feel I could feel my heart was beating slow. It was just in my head, the feeling of death. And as soon as I realized I wasn't going to die, the harsh electrical crackling sound changed to more of a whooshing sound like wind. And I know a lot of people describe that with their sleep paralysis or astral projection experiences. And an interesting thing about this electrical humming sound is that a lot of people hear a weird buzzing or crackling like Milo Aaron 8338 said, people hearing crackling plastic like candy wrapper sound is reported a lot before encountering these entities. And then I also hear a lot of stories about people feeling shocks of electricity, uh, seeing arcs of electricity, battery drain, and a lot of phenomenon associated with electronics, electrical discharge, electrons, whatever you wanna call it. This phenomenon doesn't have much research in it and I can kind of see why, because how are you going to accurately replicate the circumstances in a, a repeatable situation so we can start breaking down what it is. So my first story delving into this electrical phenomenon is a weird one that I think a lot of, I don't know if a lot of you have heard this one, but I've never heard it. It's about a strange encounter with some kind of strange sea monster in Tacoma, Washington in 1893. The morning of July 2nd left an indelible mark on a group of Tacoma gentlemen. As one eloquently put it, the ocean holds creatures beyond our wildest and most terrifying dreams. That Saturday, a distinguished group set out on a three-day fishing and hunting adventure aboard the Sloop Marion, launching from Tacoma's iconic boathouse. The crew included William Fitzhenry, the renowned auctioneer H.L. Seal W.L. McDonald J.K. Bell, and Henry Blackwood, joined by two gentlemen from the East. Interestingly, one of the Eastern guests chose anonymity, hinting at a recent treatment called the Keeley Cure. He feared judgment from friends back home, suspecting they might believe he'd relapsed. Prepared with both necessities and indulgences for the trip, it's clear that their supplies had no role in the uncanny events they'd soon witness. Relaying this tale, I endeavor to be true to their accounts, and leave the final judgment of its authenticity to each reader. The Eastern gentleman recounted, Our journey began around 4.30 p.m. on July 1st. Guided by the southeast wind, we steered towards Point Defiance. 
After anchoring there around 6pm and indulging in a bit of successful fishing, Mr MacDonald, noting a strengthening wind, suggested we set sail for Blackfish Bay on Henderson Island. He recalled an excellent trout stream there, not to mention a prime campsite. By 8pm, we were off, reaching our destination by 9.30. We quickly settled in, securing the boat and setting up camp on shore. As midnight approached, we decided to rest. Nearby, a surveyor's camp lay dormant. We chose not to disturb them, considering a friendly introduction the next day. We hoped they might offer some insight into the island's best fishing and hunting spots. A few light-hearted jokes later, the camp was steeped in silence. I believe I drifted off around midnight. However, I can't be sure how long I slept. I was jolted awake, and the bizarre discovery that all our watches had stopped only added to the mystery. His voice grew tense. It's hard to convey the sheer intensity with which we were awakened. Since the creation of the world, I doubt if sounds and sights more horrible were ever seen or heard by mortal man. I was in the midst of a pleasant dream when, in an instant, a most horrible noise rang out in the clear morning air. Instantly, the air was filled with a strong current of electricity that caused every nerve in the body to sting with pain. A light as bright as that created by the concentration of many arc lights kept constantly flashing. At first I thought it was a thunderstorm, but as no rain accompanied it, and both light and sound came from off the bay, I turned my head in that direction. If it's possible for fright to turn one's hair white, then mine ought to be snow white, for right before my eyes was a most horrible looking monster. By this time, every man in our camp, as well as the men from the camp of the surveyors, were gathered on the bank of the stream. As soon as we could gather our wits together, we began to question if what we were looking at was not the creation of the mind. However, we were soon disabused of this idea, for the monster slowly drew in toward the shore. As it approached, its head poured out a stream of water that looked like blue fire. All the while, the air seemed to be filled with electricity, and the sensation experienced was as if each man had on a suit of clothes formed of the fine points of needles. One of the men from the surveyor's camp incautiously took a few steps in the direction of the water. As he did so, the monster darted towards the shore and threw a stream of water that reached the man. He instantly fell to the ground and lay as though dead. Mr. MacDonald attempted to reach the man's body to pull it back to a place of safety. However, he was struck with some of the water that the monster was throwing and fell senseless to the earth. By this time, every man in both parties was panic-stricken. We rushed to the woods for a place of safety, leaving the fallen men lying on the beach. As we reached the woods, the demon of the deep sent out flashes of light that illuminated the surrounding country for miles, and its roar, which sounded like the roar of thunder, became terrific. When we reached the woods, we looked around and saw the monster making off in the direction of the sound. In an instant, it disappeared beneath the waters of the bay. Still, for some time, we were able to trace its course by a bright luminous light that was on the surface of the water. As the creature disappeared, total darkness surrounded us, and it took us some time to find our way back to the beach where our comrades lay. We were unable to tell the time, as the powerful electric force had stopped our watches. We eventually found MacDonald and the other man and were greatly relieved to find that they were alive, though unconscious. So, we sat down to await the coming of daylight. It arrived, I should judge, in about half an hour. By this time, through our constant efforts, both men were able to stand. Both agree that the moment the water the monster threw touched them, they became immediately unconscious. On being asked to give some description of the fish, for it was, he said, an electrical fish, the eastern man said, this monster fish, or whatever you may call it, was fully 150 feet long, and at its thickest part, I should judge about 30 feet in circumference. Its shape was somewhat out of the ordinary in so far that the body was neither round nor flat but oval. From what we could see, the upper part of the body was covered with very coarse hair. The head was shaped very much like the head of a walrus, though, of course, very much larger. Its eyes, of which it apparently had six, were as large around as a dinner plate and were exceedingly dull. And it was about the only spot on the monster that at one time or another was not illuminated at intervals of about every eight feet from its head to its tail, a substance that had the appearance of a copper band encircled its body. It was from these many bands that the powerful electric current appeared to come. The bands nearest the head seemed to have the strongest electric force, and it was from the first six bands that the most brilliant lights were emitted. Near the centre of its head were two large horn-like substances 
though they couldn't have been horns, for it was through them that the electrically charged water was thrown. Its tail, from what I could see of it, was shaped like a propeller and seemed to revolve. It may be possible that the strange monster pushes himself through the water by means of this propeller-like tail. At will, this strange monstrosity seemed to be able to emit strong waves of electric current, giving off an electromotive force which causes any person coming within the radius of this force to receive an electrotonus. This fish probably receives its power from some submarine cavern of volcanic origin, which, owing to its peculiar construction and having an extra large deposit of copper, charges the fish that inhabit that region with a strong electric force. The peculiarly shaped copper-like bands may be caused by the strong magnetic force of the fish and the copper deposits of the ocean. The strong current would form the copper into a solution, while the strong attraction of the fish would naturally form an electric battery, drawing towards it this solution, thus forming deposits on the fish. In reality, the electric fish is completely encompassed in copper, and its rapid movement through the water constantly generates frictional electricity. This, I should judge, would in a measure account for the fish being so constantly, powerfully charged with electricity, though far from its original source of supply. One of the strange characteristics of this fish, and one by which it undoubtedly obtains its food, is its higher electric control of dense and foggy atmosphere surrounding it. This amalgamates with the electrification of the fish, making a potential which causes any living creature, such as birds or insects, flying through the air to fall dead into the water. Of course, that is merely a theory, and I may be mistaken as to its origin or where it goes to, but one thing I do know, I would not encounter the same monster again for the universe. You can ask the rest of the party, and you will find that they all agree with me, that to be within such a short distance of such a terrible monster, yet live to tell the story, is something that only happens once in 1,000 years. I hardly need to tell you that we were not long in getting underway for Tacoma, and I can assure you that I have no further desire to fish anymore in the waters of this bay. There are too many peculiar inhabitants in them. I am going to send a full account of our encounter to the Smithsonian Institute, and I doubt not, but what they will send out some scientific chaps to investigate. Now I must be going, as I have to leave on tonight's train, but if you need any further particulars, you can obtain them from any of the party. No, I do not know who composed the survey party. All I know about them is that they are from Olympia, and that they were on the island running farm lines on some disputed land. Tacoma Daily Ledger, 3 July, 1893. So this monster is strange. I've never heard anything like it before. A walrus-headed sea serpent that had electrified water, copper bands around his body, and it was shooting electricity everywhere. People could feel the electrical charge in the air. And this is similar to a lot of stories about the supernatural where they'll feel tingling or electrical charge in the air. This thing seemed to use that electricity as a weapon, which I haven't really seen in any other encounters. I have a theory that the reason why so many creatures have this electrical, so many supernatural creatures have this electrical feeling with them is because it has something to do with the energy, the nuances of weird, the shamanistic or magical energy that is used that we don't understand. It's a part of nature, it's a part of the natural laws of the universe, but we don't understand it at all. I think the type of electricity that this monster was using could have been similar to the other energy fields that people feel when they're around the supernatural. But this one uses it as a weapon. It has so much of that energy that it could use it as a weapon. Blue fire-like water. Now that's pretty weird. This story is about a person's encounter with a strange camouflage creature that seemed like the predator from the movie Predator. I was walking along the hillside, just beyond the abandoned buildings of the old West film set at Bradshaw Ranch just outside Zadona, Arizona. The area is rich with history. Elvis filmed a western here, many westerns were filmed here, and there are many stories of UFOs, Bigfoot high levels of paranormal activity, and more strangeness. I was with my new friend CJ, I had heard she was a medium, and had some abilities, but I wasn't sure as the topic hadn't come up yet. My brother-in-law, Joel, was there too. He was filming us for a new documentary we were producing. As we made our way across the landscape, 
we felt guided, our path seeming predetermined, or at least not determined by us. We followed our instincts across the sand and dirt. A rare, recent snowstorm had mostly melted, but some traces left a smattering of white that glistened under the afternoon sun. CJ stopped. Do you see the shimmer? She asked. I looked ahead towards the area she was focused on, noting a gap in the small pine trees that peppered the area. I couldn't see it. Right there. It's a cloaked Bigfoot. Don't you see the shimmer? CJ replied excitedly. I continued to walk towards the gap. Right here, I replied. It just moved back. CJ responded. I never saw the shimmer, but I felt an overwhelming presence. We were not alone. This strange feeling overcame me and I turned to Joel, asking him to turn off the camera. He didn't seem surprised and obliged. I'm still not quite sure what made me say that. I continued forward through the gap a couple hundred feet while the others stayed back. I was stopped by a waist high fence. On the other side of the fence was a large tree, much larger than most of the others. Whatever it was, it was next to the tree. I couldn't see or hear it, but I knew it was there. Suddenly, the top of my head began to intensely tingle. The sensation, similar to an electric shock, made me disoriented. It only lasted a few seconds, and I soon recovered and joined the others. I shared my experience with them, but we didn't dwell on it. We left the ranch shortly after. In a few hours, I found myself curled up in a ball on a chaise lounge in the corner of the bedroom of our Airbnb, battling extreme nausea and dizziness until morning. I've heard stories of Bigfoot cloaking, with people reporting seeing the Predator effect, a reference to the Arnold Schwarzenegger film Predator. Could this creature make itself invisible, or at least translucent? CJ believed so, and I honestly don't know what else it could have been. There was one time at Salt Fork State Park in Southeast Ohio, where the team I was leading heard something approach us deep in the woods at night. We heard footsteps on the dry, fallen leaves. We went lights out, and a team member tried to locate it with a thermal camera. Nothing. The footsteps got closer, and I expected something to collide with me. I clicked on my powerful white light. Nothing was there. I ventured off the trail, shining my flashlight around, but found nothing. Back on the trail, with my light off, we all heard it walk away without ever seeing anything. Back in Arizona the following day, feeling woozy and drained, I skipped breakfast and returned to the ranch. A short time later, CG arrived. She told me she had received a message last night from Bigfoot, intended for me. Somewhat stunned and slightly skeptical, I listened. The essence of the message was, Bigfoot is trying to contact you. You need to open up more and be ready for this kind of interaction in the future. According to CJ, the creature has been interacting with me for quite some time and chose to make contact yesterday afternoon. They attempted to communicate by sending energy into my head, which I resisted. This resistance caused my ill feelings, which was not their intention. Well then, I guess I've got some homework. Open up your mind. Do I think Bigfoot can cloak? Considering my experiences, I'd say it's a possibility we have to consider. This thing's often called the Glimmer Man. It's like the Predators. It goes invisible and you can see through it. It's translucent. Optical camouflage that can bend the light. Uh, scientists are actually developing something like this and it kind of looks like that. You see a warped area of light around what's creating it. He felt an electrical feeling in his body when he came in proximity to the creature, which is often described along with uh, battery drain and tingling and all that stuff. Similar to the electrical feeling people feel when they do shamanism or astral, astral projection or sleep paralysis. And I feel like this electrical feeling has something to do with the energy, the shamanism energy. This energy that is used by shamans and by shapeshifters, uh, interdimensional travelers, creatures that seem magical to us and seem impossible, that defy logic and defy the limits of what we know is possible. There are subtle nuances to types of energy. I don't know what those nuances are, but it has something to do with all this supernatural stuff. It has something to do with why they avoid electricity. It has something to do with why they come out at night. And it has something to do with what the Native Americans and other tribes and people all over the world have been using for thousands of years that people call witchcraft, shamanism. But we have like a kindergarten 
primitive, idiotic level of knowledge about what this stuff is. If you imagine a divergent civilization, like a path that technology can take, like we took the physical science, the laws of the of reality, the laws of physics, to create wonders like TVs, cameras, video game systems, whatever. The things that we take for granted on a daily basis, a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, would be considered magical, amazing. I feel like there is another path that a civilization could take in the sciences, and that's with shamanism. I think there's a whole science, there's a way to control and understand how these energies work, and other civilizations out in the universe or in the multiverse are using this type of knowledge and basically walking circles all over us. So the fact that he could feel electricity, the fact that it drains batteries, the fact that these creatures avoid wiring and electrical areas and bright areas, it has something to do with energy, some type of energy. And it's used in a certain way that we don't understand. And we're calling it magic because we're primitive and we're idiotic. We're a very primitive people. Another thing that is relevant to high amounts of electricity or electrons is in this story, he was sick for a couple days. The Bigfoot, uh, according to the medium, the Bigfoot said that he was resisting it. When you're around high levels of electricity or EMFs, you can get nauseated, you can get disoriented, confused, and sick. And he was physically ill for a while after being around the Glimmer Man or the Invisible Bigfoot. That's another clue that it has something to do with shamanism. This next story is similar in a way, but it's a completely different creature with the same electrical feeling. This happened back in July 2004. I was living at my mother's house during summer after my freshman year of college. I was 18 years old and had actually lived in the house for a year and a half before moving away for school. My mother had moved there when my parents split up in the spring of 2002. Blah, blah, blah. I had a lot of weird things happen to me. My whole life in a variety of locations. But this incident was the worst and I think it had to do with two things that happened that day. Got in a fight with a girl I was talking to and may have thrown a little temper tantrum about it that morning. Petty, yes, I know. Out of respect, I met up with some friends and attended the viewing of one of our friend's father who had passed. Afterwards, I hung out with those friends and drove back home by midnight. No drinking or anything, but I remember being in bed by 1 a.m. as I had work the next morning. I want to make this experience easy to understand so I'm gonna bullet point. What happened next? I'm laying in bed, one leg sticking out from under the blanket. All lights are off and my ceiling fan is going. I can feel the breeze on my bare leg. I'm basically just trying to pass out since I had work really early. The door starts creaking open. That classic kinda haunted house creaking sound. Now, nothing had ever happened in this house before. Nor had I heard any stories, so my brain had no reason to start freaking out. The door keeps creaking. At this point, I think what the fuck is with the door, but I don't bother to look. I'm still trying to pass out. The room suddenly goes dead quiet, and I distinctly remember feeling the breeze from my ceiling fan stop as my exposed leg started to actually warm up, like a weird, hot sensation started. This is important. Just as I felt the air in the room stop moving and my leg get this burning sensation, an electric shock went up my back. It is very hard to describe. It was like a tingling jolt that could almost match being punched in the stomach. Immediately, or instinctively I guess. I threw the covers over my face because I just knew something was in my room. It was like something I may had felt before, as a little kid but repressed. I immediately knew that electric spine shock meant a ghost. In a split second, freak out under the covers. I knew I had to get out of the room. So I tore the blanket off and looked dead ahead at the door so I could run out. I really didn't want to see anything directly. So with blanket off my face, I saw that my door was now wide open and the purplish head shoulders of a person 
couldn't tell if man or woman, was gliding through the room. I screamed like a little girl and sprinted out of my room, down the stairs and into the den. My brother was still awake and on the phone, asking what the fuck is wrong with you. As I was on the living room floor shaking, I told him right away, I fucking saw it, I saw it. I'm not going back upstairs. Needless to say, I was up the rest of the night and have slept on the couch in the den ever since when I visit my mother. I never fuck around with that room anymore. Periodically through the years, my mother would tell me stories about other things happening. She doesn't understand my refusal to even try to sleep there again. But I ain't tempting fate. That one experience pretty much fucked my anxiety when it comes to being in any haunted location. It didn't feel residual. That electric shock made me feel targeted, like I was getting picked on. The more I thought about it over the years, Maybe that electric sensation was like a straw where the ghost used whatever energy it could get out of me to create something visual. I don't know. Maybe because it had been such a stressful day that there was enough emotional juice to fuel such a manifestation. Other things have happened since, but nothing like that. It was a full purple mist figure, not more than four feet from me, moving through my room. By far the scariest and most traumatizing thing I have ever experienced. Shadows, voices, objects moving. Yeah, all bad. But when the shit is a physical mass that can actually send some sort of electrical charge at you, I'm out. So I post this story because I want to know if anyone else ever felt that spine tingling shock. It's like a rush you get when someone scares you but completely rooted in your back. Hard to explain. I figure since it happened to me and it felt familiar, that other people have probably been struck by it as well, just before witnessing something paranormal. Sorry for the length, but I always enjoy discussing this occurrence because all my memories of it are so vivid. This story had a couple things that I think are related to the energy from shamanism what we call magic, what we call, we think is witchcraft, but actually isn't, it's some kind of science that we don't understand. I can't emphasize that enough. We think it's magic, we think shamanism and people who do witchcraft is all hokey pokey. And I'd have to agree with you, a lot of it is, a lot of people don't know what they're doing. But it's like having primitive scientists dabble in the sciences, like Greeks thought that there's four elements that made up everything wind fire earth water primitive we have a primitive view a primitive understanding of what it is and because of the stigmatism against it there is no research being done with it and there's no really delving into or an understanding and expanding on this information or this whole this field of science that exists that we're completely ignoring which i don't think we'll ignore forever two aspects of the story make me think it has something to do with shamanism or the energy that the strange energy used in shamanism the first one was the intense feeling of fear the hairs on the back of your neck standing up in recent discussions on the neurological foundations of our emotions particularly fear the amygdala emerges as a central figure this almond-shaped cluster of nuclei deep within the brain has ties to a variety of psychiatric disorders from anxiety and PTSD to depression. What's more, its links to motor areas position it at a unique intersection, making it relevant in the study of movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease. Deep brain stimulation, an electrical neuromodulation technique primarily used for Parkinson's, has shed light on the potential responsiveness of the amygdala to electrical stimuli Given that deep brain stimulation targets motor regions, which share connections with the amygdala, it's conceivable that any stimulation meant for these motor regions could inadvertently influence the amygdala. This is of particular interest since the amygdala houses oscillatory frequencies that could play a role in our emotional and motor functions. Any alteration in these frequencies, whether through direct stimulation or external influence, might lead to changes in emotional responses. This poses an intriguing hypothesis could high levels of certain frequencies of energy, particularly intense electromagnetic fields, 
trigger a fear reaction in people. If direct, targeted electrical stimulation has the capacity to influence the amygdala, might these intense energy fields have a similar impact? While deep brain stimulation operates with precision, the interactions of such energy fields with the human body remain largely a mystery. If the amygdala proves susceptible to these fields, it could provide insight into instances where individuals experience feelings of unease or fear when exposed to areas with significant energy concentrations. I actually heard a story of a people that thought they were haunted and kept moving from house to house to house. This was a long time ago and I couldn't find this article for the life of me. But it turned out that their radio had a broken emitter and it was emitting a strange frequency of electricity. And that strange frequency was causing a very eerie, creepy feeling. Which told me that just because it feels scary doesn't necessarily mean it is or it's evil. It's just a visceral knee-jerk reaction we have to some type of strange energy that we don't understand. And a lot of people get scared when they're encountered with an alien sensation or thrust into the unknown like that. So the fear reaction may be because it's evil or because it's unknown and it, it's really strange feeling and it makes people scared. That's the first one. The second one was the electrical shock that went up his spine. So he actually felt electricity and then he saw the purple floating ghostly figure floating through and it scared the hell out of him. He was scared. And these feelings of electricity are often talked about in UFO encounters. Now if I had the time I could have gathered hundreds of these stories but I'm trying to produce one every week and I don't want to make 10 hour long videos each time. So this next story is about an unidentified flying object with a feeling of electricity. We were having a family friends get together to celebrate a birthday. During the celebration, two of my nephews and a niece came tearing into the house, screaming at the top of their lungs, saying that a plane crashed in one of the adjacent pastures. My brother? Myself and about three others walked outside to see what was causing all the ruckus. We didn't see anything out of the ordinary except a strange burning smell that smelled like burning mesquite. We didn't think anything of it since it was kind of nippy and someone could have been burning some wood in their fireplaces. We told them to show us where they saw the plane go down and we walked over to the place they showed us. The first thing we noticed was that all the dogs in the area were going bonkers. They were barking up a storm like they were all seeing the same thing. The area we live in is pretty much a rural community, unless you live in the city of Monahans, Texas. Many of the houses are set on large plots of land, usually four to five acres per house. Although we can see the houses of many of our neighbors, and we do have traffic on the road, you do get the feeling of being all to yourself out here. Some of the land by our house is overrun by wild mesquite trees. Only a small portion of the land surrounding the house is cultivated and cleared out. Beyond the stand of trees runs a small barbed wire fence that separates us from our neighbors, who I could see were home from the lights on in the house. We walked around the edge of the trees, not wanting to really go into the stand at night. Even though it's technically winter, there could be rattlesnakes seeking shelter in amongst the trees, not to mention that mesquite trees have some wicked thorns that protrude from them. They are razor sharp and quite capable of punching through a pair of jeans or boots, and they hurt like hell. As we looked around, we started noticing a sort of electrical charge to the very air around us. Almost like the kind you feel when you approach a large electrical substation or a charged and active radio antenna. As we made our way around the trees, one of my brothers noticed some light peeking through the trees. I told him it was probably one of the neighbors leaving or coming home. He promptly told me that it couldn't be headlights because the light seemed too diffused and not as concentrated as a car's headlight. We moved around and as we cleared the stand of trees, we were shocked to see an oval-shaped object hovering, maybe four to five feet off the ground. We stood there in total shock and awe. I can only imagine that our jaws were probably on the ground. As we stood there watching this object hover there without a sound, I took note that the object was maybe about 30 to 40 feet from front to back. It was maybe the same dimensions around. The object seemed to be of a highly polished material that reflected the area around it. The reflection of the distant streetlights from the surrounding neighbors' properties seemed to reflect off the surface of the object. There was also a small, dull glow to the object, barely noticeable, unless you were really looking almost like an aura of sorts, a iridescent blue of sorts. 
As we stood there in total shock, my brother next to me expressing his disbelief, we saw two strange-looking men appear from around the object. They at first didn't notice us. They were busy running around and gathering objects from the ground, from the trees. They didn't seem to notice us at first. They looked to be about the size of my oldest nephew, about four feet tall, but they looked very skinny, like they had no meat on their bones. Their heads were large and their arms were long, skinny, and hung down around their knees. About this time, my two nephews came walking up behind us, scaring the hell out of us. They saw the object and the strange men, and in a voice that only a kid can project, screamed out loud, What are those things? That's when the creatures turned and noticed us. The sight of these creatures was something that will haunt me till the day I die. It turned and looked right at us. Its eyes were large, almost like the eyes of a praying mantis, except they were jet black and wrapped around its head. The two creatures looked at us for about seven seconds, not an ounce of movement, before they calmly walked around the craft, one right after the other. They disappeared behind the craft and we never saw them again. A few seconds later, the craft lifts up, not a sound coming from the object, no rush of wind, not even a swaying of the nearby branches of a mesquite tree. It rose quietly and hovered about 40 feet from the ground and shot out like a bat out of hell. As it zoomed away, it started glowing and made it easier to track as it zoomed away, getting higher and higher till it faded away. We stood there in complete silence as we tried to make heads or tails of what the hell we just saw. My brother finally piped up and said, should we call the police? After which I burst out in laughter and replied to him and tell them what? My nephew looked like he had just seen the devil himself, which considering what we just saw, I don't blame him. He didn't want to talk about it, and after we made our way back to the house, he still didn't talk about it. I tried to ask him about it yesterday, and he basically told me that he didn't want to think about it yet. He was still processing what had happened to him. I was more than happy to leave it at that. I never really believed in the subject of UFOs or aliens, but after the events of this night, I'm seriously going to reevaluate that belief. I know that I plan to keep my mind open and start looking up towards the sky a little bit more from now on. Here's a little quote from the story that you just heard, so you don't need me to quote it. We started noticing a sort of electrical charge to the very air, uh, similar to the weird walrus-headed monster, uh, similar to the strange creature floating through the room, and that's uh, similar to the glimmer man or bi invisible transparent Bigfoot that was in the area. These aren't the same things. UFO, the UFO little alien things are not the same as Bigfoot. Uh, whatever that floating thing was, some kind of category of interdimensional or interplanar traveler that we don't even have a clue as to what it could possibly be is not a Bigfoot and it is not a UFO. That huge um, walrus creature was not associated with any of these other things. The only thing that these things have in common is that they're all strange. They're not part of what's known to exist in this world. Like we have not definitively classified Bigfoot as a real thing. We don't know what that strange purple glow creature was. And again, that purple glow, that, that glowing energy and the color, I think that's another clue that we don't understand. Probably similar to the glowing red eyes, the glowing purple eyes, something to do with the color of the glow and the type of energy that's being emitted. It might even have be related to the color of auras because I know auras that are red are associated with anger. So that may be why the glowing red eyes, but I'm getting sidetracked. My point is none of these things are the same, yet they share similarities with the electrical charge in the air the feeling of electricity you could dismiss some of these stories and say well that creature was like a giant electric eel and that was just a byproduct of its uh, hunting mechanism which could be true and oh the ufos are advanced technology and they generate high amounts of electricity and it makes a tingling feeling around you again that could be true that could be the reason or oh Bigfoot are aliens that have cloaking technology devices and it emits a high amount of electricity and it feels that tingling sensation. Again, I don't, I don't even know if that thing was a Bigfoot. That lady CJ just was like, oh, it's a Bigfoot. She might be right, but she might be wrong. Like, I don't know how reliable she is. I don't even know who she is. But that strange floating entity, purple entity in the room, was that 
uh, technology making the electrical feeling again. When my dad did telekinesis, he pointed at a pot and he was in a room. The pot was empty, didn't have water in it. It was just sitting on a shelf. He stood up and he pointed at it and a bunch of people saw him and the metal exploded when he pointed at it. And my dad said that when he did that, he felt a buzzing electricity in his head. When I have out of body experiences, when my uh, I'm in sleep paralysis, I feel electricity buzzing in me. I feel the same. It's very similar to what my dad experienced when he pointed at the pot. And then another thing is that my mom is a shaman. She's a healer and she could feel vibrations, electricity when with her hands, the same as how I feel it in my head, her hands buzz, they vibrate like electricity, like, like she's putting her hands on people and she can feel a disruption in energy when they're injured. When she feels portals, it feels like a weird vortex, like spinning energy. And when she feels injuries, it could feel like spikes of electricity hitting her. I'm, I'm not her, so I, I'm not going to speak for her too much. All these things with shamanism, like out of body, traveling out of your body and feeling electrical shocks and charges, the hands feeling the electrical charges from a shaman, telekinesis feeling electrical charges, you're around a UFO or a little person, people feel electricity or buzzing, people hearing like, uh, let me go back to that guy's comment. Milo Aaron talking about hearing crackling plastic like a candy wrapper sound is reported a lot before encountering supernatural entities. And what does that crackling, uh, what does that kind of sound like? Popping electricity. So something that sounds like crackling plastic or a rushing wind or a roar, shamanism, shamanism, shamanism. A strange type of electricity a strange type of the use of electrons that's being used in advanced ways by other cultures and other civilizations that we don't understand and we're attributing it to magic. To them, it might be as simple as how we turn on a TV and it just works. They, they learned it, they, went to, they did education on it, it's second nature to them, it's easy for them to do, but to us, it's like looking it's like a caveman looking at a TV and wondering how the hell that thing's working. We're primitive. We don't know anything about these things, so we're calling it magic. We're offhandedly dismissing it as if it's nothing. And this leads me to another piece of supporting evidence about a guy's Bigfoot encounter. This is from the History Channel. The proof is out there. Alarming noises follow a teacher. The proof is out there. Alarming noises follow a teacher. So my name is Chase Floyd. I live in Northeast Pennsylvania and I'm a middle school science teacher. It was like four in the morning, if I remember, and I could hear. So those whoops are exactly what I hear. Sorry for interrupting. Like hooting and hollering and like whelps and whoops and, and things like that. And immediately I was very confused as what was going on. There's something up in those mountains. I didn't really know what to think. And I, I kind of thought that I was being pranked or hoaxed. I just go out my property and start exploring the area. And then things started getting weird. So I've done some research on, on unusual animal sounds. So a lot of uh, like canines make weird Definitely noises, a big but fun. nothing that would make the sounds that are in the video. At least not I know from Pennsylvania. So I figured I got to a point where I was like, I had to be there for at least like 15 or so minutes, and uh, noises were getting louder and louder. And the tone of it kind of changes, and I start not feeling really well. The adrenaline, the excitement, kind of turned into like feeling kind of sick. So this is uh, another thing that with energy if you're around high amounts of electricity or emfs 
Some of the symptoms are nausea, confusion, disorientation, and this is exactly what he's describing. He started feeling nauseated, started feeling sick. As if being around these creatures, there's some type of energy or electron field that's making him feel ill. Here, right now, I'm starting to get lightheaded, so I really don't feel good being down here. So I'm just gonna grab. I really don't feel good right now. And I remember my head started to hurt and it got kind of like, like a tension headache. Um, and then I started feeling kind of nauseous, but I wanted to keep investigating, I wanted to keep seeing what was going on. So I you know, kept on filming and I was trying to get uh, I guess to the bottom of things. I don't want to be here too long though if that, uh, that noise continues. That noise was getting louder and louder and I was like, you know what, I should probably just uh, get out of here. So I really don't feel good. He's getting more and more sick from being around that energy, the energy field. This is freaking me. And this is described in a lot of missing 411. People start feeling sick and disoriented. Yeah. I wasn't feeling good. I was getting kind of dizzy. There's just sounds coming from every direction. And uh, I got to a point where I was like, you know what, I just kind of want to get out of here and lay down and, uh, you know, kind of just move past it. I'm getting out of here. <laughs>